Hello. So my name is Brad Mullen. I'm a neurosurgeon. I work at the Mount Carmel Health Systems in uh, Columbus, Ohio. And I've used the Body Tom uh, intraoperatively since 2014. And today I want to speak mostly about my uses in uh, spine surgery. And disclosures, I do act as a consultant for Stryker, as, and I'm doing this under a consultant agreement from Neurologica. I really want to speak about uh, the use of interoperative CT along with navigation. And I think mirroring the two really gives you the most advantage uh, to uh, the use of the interoperative CT. I would like to compare and contrast the interoperative CT, the body tom, with other types of units really that are more like 3D fluoro units as such and tell you some of the advantages of the body tom. So the real advantage of the body tom is that it is truly a full uh, CT. And if you want to image the spine in more of a global sense so that you can see things like spinal alignment, you can image the full pelvis all in one field of view. So you can navigate, say, to put in pelvic screws or put in S2 alar iliac screws. It really is the body tom that you that you really need to utilize. And as since really complex spine surgery is moving more and more to discussions of alignment like sagittal balance and coronal balance, et cetera, uh, being able to see the spine in a, a longer segment is really useful. I've given a lot of talks about radiation reduction to staff and surgeons, and, and I think this is an important use of interoperative CT combined with navigation, and we'll deal, detail that in a minute. There are a lot of reasons that the body tom is a real advantage in terms of seeing the spine in, in areas where it's often difficult to image. For example, the uh, cervical thoracic junction, uh, high BMI patients, and if you use a 3D a fluoro type of uh, system, you'll see that there's ghosting, seeing cortical margins to understand, uh, say, a thread penetration, those types of things are, are much more difficult unless you're actually looking at a CAT scan. There are times in which you like to visualize non-spinal anatomy. So for example, if you're operating and uh, you're concerned about a, a anterior breach and uh, unfortunately potential injury to vascular structures uh, in front of the spine, the, you have at your uh, disposal a full CT that will actually see the detail. There are a lot of uh, interoperative decisions that you can make uh, when you have a full CAT scanner, for example, you know, if you're going to connect to a previous fusion construct, you can see what's fused, what's not fused, or sometimes you'll make decisions on the fly about whether or not uh, a level can, needs to uh, have an inner body device or not based upon uh, whether or not you can actually see that it's uh, fused uh, as, you're, as you're working. It's really useful for uh, use in distorted anatomy. There are times in which unexpectedly you'll find pedicle in, in an odd position, pedicle that's not really being able to accept a screw, and it's really nice to see that, you know, uh, in real time. I've learned to, I think, do what's called reading the bone structure. So, for example, when you're placing a screw, and the sacrum's a good example of this, the, there'll be areas of higher density and lower density, and if you want to uh, prevent lucencies with time, you can actually shoot for the areas of uh, stronger bone. I've used it a little bit in cranial applications, and Dr. Wernicke will speak more about this, after a pituitary resection to verify that you actually brought a uh, mass down off the chiasm. I like to, uh, after I do a stereotactic biopsy, to run the a body tom to look for a bleed before I leave the OR. In spine surgery, you know, a real goal is to reduce uh, takebacks to the OR, say, if the uh, hardware is not malplaced, and at least a spin be of the scanner before you leave the OR uh, should prevent that. And it's very useful for use in MIS surgery, uh, specifically with a spine mask. Uh, it's how I use it. That's a striker product. And there are other, other types of products that you can use, but it works very nicely with the spine mask, and we'll show an example of that here in a moment. So in terms of radiation exposure, uh, there are many studies out there which detail that when you're using fluoroscopy in surgery, there really is a lot of exposure to radiation, 
not only to the surgeon, but to everybody around that table. And if you start to add up the amounts of exposure, it's, it's remarkable. And if you then take that over a 30-year career, if you are putting these medical screws in uh, under live fluoroscopy, you're going to get a great deal of exposure. And this is a study from 2013 that shows the milliram exposure per minute of everybody around that table. This is a study in 2010, which showed that, and I believe that we, we've attained this too, essentially zero exposure to the surgeon and operating staff because we actually leave the room. And as part of uh, one of our physicists have done is they've, they've measured any exposure even outside of the room and we're, we're at zero. So if you use this in combination with uh, navigation, uh, you should be able to, to bring your exposure down to a very minimal amount. And just uh, to kind of compare to what milligrams mean, a chest X-ray is about 10. In other words, if you are using the fluoro continuously, you may be talking about a, a couple of chest X-rays a day. I know we wear lead, but very few people I know wear leaded glasses, and the exposure to the, to the uh, lens uh, gives you a, a risk of cataracts, and that risk is linear over years of exposure. In navigation in combination with interoperative imaging gives you superior accuracy. Here's three studies that demonstrate that accuracy is much higher uh, when you use computer-aided uh, navigation. And at times, mount misplacements, although they're not always significant and may or may not hurt the construct, there are patients who, who are injured by uh, malplaced devices. And as we mentioned, when you're taking back a patient to move a screw, of course, is yet another surgery with the risks of anesthesia. And estimated cost of a take back is about $60,000. And there's, it's conceivable that at times that insurers may not pay for those take backs uh, for that purpose. So some of the things uh, three-dimensional navigation can overcome, you do a lot of spine surgery, you, you'll note, you know, there's a lot of variability in, uh, between patients and, and shapes of the vertebral body and the pedicles. Obesity, as you know, with fluoro, sometimes you just flat out can't see. Osteoporosis and trying to find stronger bone, it's really useful in scoliosis and kyphosis where nothing is in a normal plane. We talked a little bit about radiation exposure, and obviously we're trying to avoid any uh, injury to other structures. So I call this the little shop of horrors. Uh, these are not my cases, but uh, people walk into your office uh, with these malplacements, and at times they can be quite, quite catastrophic with the aorta, uh, for example, being uh, very close to a, in a thoracic screw placement. So this is obviously what we're trying to avoid. At least a scan before you leave the OR should help you avoid this, this situation. When you use the body, Tom, there is extraordinarily important that you develop a workflow and that er everybody in the room, all the staff, becomes very proficient in understanding the, the flow from all the way from the positioning of the patient all the way through the taking of the scan. And so, for example, you know, we, we have open and MIS workflows. The table is very good uh, in terms of trying to induce lordosis in the spine, uh, which is, of course, a goal. When we uh, are navigating, uh, I always place screws first before I uh, do a decompression because the decompression loses the spinal structure and changes, your, changes the uh, accuracy. With MIS, it's very useful because we scan the patient before we even open, so uh, we we're able to use navigation to direct our approach and minimize our exposure. So these are some images that we took to show the, first of all, the arm boards, so that initially when we got the, the body time, the table was turned so that the head was away from anesthesia. They didn't like that very much, so very quickly, we went to an extension so that anesthesia got the head back. And then there are arm boards that, and positioning of the arm boards are very important. If we're going to L2, above L2, we'll tuck the arms. If we're going below L2, we'll use the arm boards. 
but we always do a trial run before we do any draping uh, just to make certain that the patient is positioned appropriately for the uh, run. Table height is ex extraordinarily important, part of the positioning to make certain that once we know exactly what patient, position the patient has to be in to run the body tom, that we can just position the patient. So this shows the table where we've actually uh, selected the height and then we'll use a, um, a marker, a erasable marker to show exactly where it has to be so that uh, there's no mistake in, in the positioning. Draping, we've gone to using a fluoroscopy drape, basically, which is quite cheap and enables you to actually see the patient, see the wound and when you're uh, running the body tongue. Uh, in open cases, I like very much to use fiducial screws. It adds the greatest accuracy to the uh, scan. And so it's very common for us to have a sub-millimeter accuracy when we're actually uh, doing our navigation. So here's this is, shows the uh, sc uh, fiducial screws. We just use CMF screws, uh, little cranial plating screws. Then we select them and feed them into the uh, navigation uh, system uh, and then select them as known points. I call the running the body time a spin. Uh, this uh, should show a spin. Uh, you can see the patient is positioned, the table height was selected, the patient's draped, and then we'll run this in position. And then the body time will give you a, uh, a scout run, and then you can actually then uh, leave the room for the scout. Uh, we I walk in and check the scout to make certain that everything is seen on the scout. Uh, and then we actually run this, the spin. So this is just coming in position uh, for that. One consideration when you're doing interoperative imaging and navigation is the, the consideration that maybe it takes too long and you're adding to the case. Here's our timing. So uh, I generally, I always do a, a first scan to do my navigation, then a conformatory scan. So this is actually timed I'm away from the table, 15 minutes for the first scan and seven minutes for the confirmatory scan. So it really, that amount of time added to the case to me is definitely worth the benefits. This shows you the, the spine mask and how it's used. So it sticks to the patient and has both the, uh, basically the fiducials and the transmitters in place. And then this shows a body time scout uh, where it's, it's, I don't know if you can see it, but there are little, uh, little fiducials you can see. And so as you can see, when you run the body time, you can basically scan as much or as little as you want uh, of the uh, spine. As we get into more and more percutaneous screws, obviously the, uh, the body time is very useful. Not my picture, but you know, as you can imagine, they've shown that with percutaneous screws and you use the fluoroscopy like this, the amount of radiation is even higher than those other data that I showed you. The structure visualization is really quite superior between the body tom and the uh, O-arm. Not only the cortical margin, but also the adjacent structures are very well visualized as we talked about, you know, the, the risk of perhaps a retroperitoneal bleed. Uh, I think it's very, very good for placing screws into the pelvis. Uh, because of the field of view, you can actually see the entire pelvis, so you don't need to take multiple images. And uh, if you can appreciate, as you're crossing the SI joint, there's different areas that have uh, more or less density that you may want to try and pierce with your screws. Uh, so it, it's very good at, at doing uh, screws like this. Here's a, a case where, you know, we wanted to know that for sure that uh, we were uh, fused at 4.5 to connect. And then this is an example of this, uh, looking at the sacrum where you'll have different densities of bone and the promontory here where you want to shoot to anchor your screw, if at all possible. We do all of our screw sizing basically on the fly. So we'll, we'll do a virtual screw and see what we think about it in relation to the pedicle, trying to use the, uh, the diameter of the pedicle to its greatest extent. Uh, when we place inner body devices, we, we do a virtual inner body device and look at uh, the placement and the sizing. So again, we're not doing any of this under fluoroscopy. As we talked, screw visualization with uh, the body tom is really superior. You can actually visualize the cortical margins 
when you're looking for a breach. And obviously with very, very important structures, very close, then uh, accuracy becomes paramount. Spinal balance, as we, we work on things like sagittal balance, the, you can scan as much as you want. And then in your confirmatory scan, you can actually look and see how well you uh, did your correction. Uh, this is an example of a, what was a very difficult case. This was a C12 disarticulation from a car accident. Basically, uh, they pull, the patient pulled C1 uh, off of C2. We actually uh, tried to do this patient, and, and once we positioned them, they lost their signals from uh, monitoring, so we, we put them in a halo and then did it again. So, this, so we did our Bonnie Tom work uh, actually in a halo. You can see all the, all the apparatus the, that we had to use to try and position this patient, uh, but it, it went very well. We ultimately got a nice occipital cervical uh, structure with the, uh, with the use of the body time and navigation. High BMI is very uh, difficult at times, as you can imagine. Uh, this was a huge BMI uh, patient, and this is the hula hoop test. I actually have one of these in my office that I use to make certain that the uh, a gantry will work on a given patient. You can say, well, that looks a little degraded, but this is that same patient. And doing this under fluoroscopy would, uh, I would say it was probably pretty much uh, impossible. So uh, thank you. If there's any questions. How long did it take you to establish your workflow? Also, can you scale down the dosage for smaller constructs? I would say it's probably a 20 case learning curve, especially when I try and have constant staff if you can uh, because everybody gets used to it and absolutely you can scan as short a segment or as long a seg segment as you want and the dosage comes from the number of, of segments scanned.